As we know, obesity rates have been rising as the culture and accessibility around food has changed so drastically from what we would have seen 50 years ago. This problem is becoming so great that it has been labeled an epidemic by health professionals. An epidemic that is greatly impacting our younger generations. With that said, there exist some people, even dietitians, who don't believe there is a weight problem happening at all. And any attempt to address childhood obesity only leads to catastrophic consequences. Today, we will be diving into the problem of childhood obesity, the pushback from fat activists, and answering the big question, is treating childhood obesity more dangerous than obesity itself? Disclaimer, I am not a doctor or a health professional of any kind. Any medical information I present is all available online from prominent health resources. If your child is dealing with obesity, please contact professionals who can help. This video is for commentary and general educational purposes. It is not to be used as medical advice. Part 1. Is a childhood obesity epidemic real? So let's make it clear. There is substantial evidence that children are fatter now than they ever have been. This is recorded in multiple scholarly articles, research, even the CDC. There is no rebuking the fact that kids are statistically more overweight and obese than they were 30 or even 10 years ago. The epidemic has also not helped in recent years with bringing the rates down, as you can imagine. So why are these rates skyrocketing? We live in a very obesogenic society, and this doesn't even go for just developed countries like North America or England but underdeveloped countries as well are seeing high rates of obesity more than ever before. We live in a world where the main goal for companies is to sell, sell, sell. So when it comes to food, the best way to sell it is to market it as appealing and fun as possible, and to make it as tasty as possible. When it comes to the food or drink being healthy, corporations don't really have to care about that, because health of a person relies on that person or their caregiver not the corporation. Kids are a major area for interest when it comes to marketing foods. Fun characters on cereal, bright colored snacks, crazy candies, and now trends all over the internet promoting overconsumption of junk foods. I think the surge of mukbangs over the past couple years is a clear evidence of the appeal of eating lots of unhealthy foods. Corporations are definitely taking advantage of what is basically free marketing to kids. Many snacks and drinks are literally made to fit in the palm of a child's hand, and the commercials for them play between their cartoons or while they scroll social media. There aren't really any good solid laws in place, at least here in America, to prevent corporations from marketing to kids. It seems like these corporations almost rely on a kid seeing something they want online or on TV, going to the store with their parent and throwing a public tantrum until the parent caves in. I think we have all either been that kid or have at least seen it on a grocery run. And now we have fast food with fun toys and a kid's meal. They have playgrounds and mascots that draw in children's interests. I remember going to McDonald's almost weekly with my siblings because my mom would be working and it was easier to let my little brother play at the play place and get dollar menu items than almost to try and entertain and feed him when I was only 10 years old. This is also something these food giants rely on. Overworked and overwhelmed parents who will want to pick the easiest thing and the cheapest thing. This could be feeding your family with a quick hot meal from the drive through after a long shift or heating up off-brand Hot Pockets in the microwave. When discussing the food climate we exist in, we cannot ignore how we are manipulated daily to buy things that are bad for us through marketing, government subsidizing, access, etc. Of course, this is not me saying parents have no responsibility or control. They do. But it is a lot easier said than done, especially when there is a lack of resources and access to cheap nutritious foods, depending on where they live and income. Children can get addicted, for lack of a better term, to sugary foods. Trying to basically detox a child is a lot of work, for parents who may not understand the chemical reliance these foods can create. 
Given all those shortcomings and roadblocks, parents can still prevent their children from becoming obese or remaining obese when living in less fortunate circumstances if they know what they're doing. So, what about genetics? We hear a lot from the fat acceptance community that genetics play a larger role in obesity than eating habits. The science does not support this, though. While researchers and doctors alike recognize epigenetic factors that can make people more likely to be overweight or obese, it is not a definite. This article states, Genetic factors identified so far to only make a small contribution to obesity risk. Many people who carry the so-called obesity gene do not become overweight, and a healthy lifestyle can counteract these giant, these genetic factors. So, while genetics can increase the likelihood of obesity, it is not a predetermined thing out of anyone's control. Parents being obese increases the likelihood of obese kids by 10 to 12 times. Even in the beginning stages of childhood, when kids are able to regularly consume solids and different drinks, they gain more weight on average than kids of parents of healthier weights. This is seen to be a mixture of epigenetics and eating habits that are passed down from parent to child. But again, healthy eating can combat those epigenetic factors. So what are the health issues that make childhood obesity so dangerous? The risk of childhood obesity includes type 2 diabetes, fatty liver disease, hormone imbalances, even respiratory issues depending where the fat is stored. Researchers have clear evidence showing the rise of these diseases and health issues in mainly overweight children. Something that is interesting to know is that type 2 diabetes used to be called late adult onset diabetes, but now it is commonly recognized as a disease children get, and it is completely preventable. Here are some statistics presenting the increase of type 2 diabetes in children. Just in 2022, one in six patients admitted to the American Family Children's Hospital who came due to new diabetes had type 2 diabetes. Again, this is a type of diabetes that used to not be common at all in children. This statistic is alarming. Fatty liver disease, also called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, is another thing children were not recorded getting until these major shifts in how we eat. It is another issue that is preventable. 38% of obese children have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, as shown in this statistic. Being obese as a child, or even overweight, comes with social issues as well, not just health. Kids are brutal, and these formative years are important in a child's developing sense of self. Since excess fat can cause hormone issues as well, puberty may start earlier in overweight children, further othering them from their peers and creating a sense of uncomfortableness within the child. Now, I obviously advocate for teaching your kids not to bully anyone, but I also advocate for making sure your kid is in the best position possible to have a healthy mental state. Childhood obesity has been shown to increase depression, anxiety, and other mood issues that can be attributed to either social problems or the mess of hormones, or both. It would be incorrect to assume all psychological issues stemmed from obesity are purely due to other people. There are chemical components of this. Now, let's look at some TikToks from people who grew up fat and are expressing the negative impacts of it. So, this TikTok has the text, Fat acceptance girlies in my comments after I said I was going to do everything in my power to make sure my kids don't deal with childhood obesity the same way I did. And the audio completes it, showing how fat acceptance people are very against talking about preventing childhood obesity. So this is one of the more silly ones we will look at, but I think it still rings true. It is very responsible to do what you can, obviously within reason, to make sure your child is healthy. Growing up obese was clearly not fun for her, and it is normal to want better for your children than what you experienced as a kid. It is wild to me this is even problematic. Would it be bad if someone who grew up poor and made sure to set their child up for success and provide money to take care of them in a way the parent never got to experience? No, of course not. Applying the same logic to preventing obesity is completely understandable.
That's the kind of stuff you watch from a distance. <laughs> this is the same creator, and the first part of the TikTok shows her as an obese child with the text, me being morbidly obese and nonstop feeding myself growing up as a trauma response. Then the next part says, my entire family ignoring it because they convinced themselves it was just baby fat. This is really common. I think we all have seen this at some point. People excusing signs of obesity as being just baby fat. That's why it is so important to keep in contact with your kids' doctors so you know if it is natural, healthy fat, or obesity. Here's an excerpt from an article quoting a pediatric doctor. People say kids will outgrow baby fat when they are teens. The majority don't outgrow the baby fat. A lot of overweight teens end up as overweight adolescents and then overweight adults. There's no magic time you start losing all your fat just because you have a growth spurt. That's a misconception. We are very proactive now and have to start early. For this TikTok, the text on the screen says, POV, you're 19 and still undoing the damage of being an obese child when you consume 3,000 calories a day in year 6. And the audio implies she wishes she could turn back time, I'm assuming to fix it. This is unfortunate, and another example as to why parents need to be conscious of their kids' eating habits. How they eat does impact their health. Part 2. Is childhood obesity a form of neglect? This is a very heavy question. No one wants to be accused of neglecting their child, and it is not something to just bring up lightly. Childhood obesity has a complex root, and while parents in the end are responsible for their child's health, the knowledge and resources to properly deal with that, or even prevent it, are not equally available to all. I think it is fair to say that parents don't desire for their kids to be obese. Here is a TikTok of someone who believes having obese children is a sign of neglect. We'll discuss whether or not I agree with him after. What is something that you'll get a lot of hate for if you say it out loud? <sighs> okay. Child obesity is abuse. I believe parents should be held accountable because the children don't know no better, but parents should, or adults should, grown-ups should know better. You want to feed yourself crap and make yourself unhealthy, you go ahead. But the child doesn't have a choice in what you feed it. Therefore, if they are obese, it's not like you didn't see it happening. It's not like you can't tell. It's not like the doctors haven't told you. There should be punishment for that because it is, in my opinion, abuse. It's wrong. The child, the child is innocent and you are literally creating someone with health issues later on down the line. They should be allowed to sue you. If they get to like adulthood and decide it was your fault, 100%. So Chris here is a bit more extreme in his approach to childhood obesity. He thinks parents should be punished, I assume he means charged with neglect, if their child is obese. That parents should know better than to pass on bad eating habits. In a perfect world where everyone had equal access to health and being obese or having a bad relationship with food was very rare or even hard to accomplish, I would agree. But that isn't the world we live in. We already discussed all the ways society promotes unhealthy foods and normalizes it to the point where it is just expected to be eating those. Obese parents are more likely to have obese children. And we find that most obese children do, do have obese or overweight family members. The fat acceptance movement would see this as being genetic but it is less genetic and more a passing down of bad eating habits. If parents think obesity is just genetic, they won't change their diet and will pass it down to the kid, creating almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you don't think food is the issue, you aren't going to try and change it. In the end, there is no gene that makes people obese without any outside involvement. Now, does this mean parents with obese kids deserve to be charged with neglect? No, I think that is ridiculous, dangerous, and not helpful to the child at all. The answer to helping obese kids is more resources from government and health professionals. The health of kids should be a priority in our society, but little resources go to that. Parents aren't perfect, and being healthy in today's world is a lot harder than it used to be. 
the extra help is needed for many families who may have never thought about their eating habits. The only time I think any parent of an obese or even underweight child should be charged with neglect is if it is intentional, as in the parent wants the child to be very heavy or very thin and takes steps to assure that. This could also manifest as parents recognizing their kid's issue with weight and purposefully doing nothing about it, even with knowledge and resources to do so. Here are some extreme cases of neglect in obese children. A 13-year-old died from a heart condition brought upon by obesity in the UK. The mother, quote, prevented the teen from participating in physical activities, along with continuing to provide fast food for them as the child was dying in the hospital. It was reported that the child ate over 2,000 calories before lunch. This was a lifelong issue for the kids, be short 13 years, as even at three years old, the kid was 66 pounds. For reference, the average healthy weight range of a three-year-old is between 25 and 38 pounds. This child was double their peers as a toddler. Another case of this is the death of 16-year-old Kaylee Titford, whose health was neglected, leading to her death. And when you hear health neglect, people tend to think of a starving child. But no, she was overfed and undernourished. Her parents' lack of concern for her health led to morbid obesity, which grew worse during the first lockdown of COVID. The parents were charged with, quote, gross negligence, manslaughter, in causing or allowing the death of a child or vulnerable person. The parents of these kids deserve to be charged, as they purposely made and kept their kids obese, to the point of feeding them junk food on their deathbeds. I don't see this as being any different than intentionally starving your child. Now, this is an extreme example of childhood obesity and neglect. The takeaway from these tragic stories shouldn't be all parents of overweight kids should be put in jail. The takeaway should be that this does happen, and it may be happening more, but that is a personal opinion. I have no statistic to support that. So, as a final response to Chris's TikTok, I don't think parents should be charged with neglect just because their kid is obese. That literally helps no one. CPS already has so many issues. I don't see letting them take kids away because they are fat being a good idea, especially when CPS is known to impact poor people the most who are already more likely to be obese. I really don't like giving the government another reason to take away kids and traumatize them. If we want to actually do something about childhood obesity, we need to recognize that it isn't as simple as parents wanting to keep their kids obese. Just like we need more resources to feed hungry kids, we need more resources to help obese kids and loving families who just don't know how to fix their situation or don't even know that they are in a bad situation. And even if they do know they need help, the access to help should be readily available for anyone of any income. As discussed in the beginning, childhood obesity impacts future health as well. So even if the child is not currently dealing with the extremes of obesity, it is very important to get that under control. There are probably kids out there who, through their parents' neglect of health, will die of diseases that could have been prevented during the formative years. For that reason, parents who wish to provide the best outcomes for their kids should take into account their future health as well. Part 3. The people who think childhood obesity isn't an issue. While there are some who think childhood obesity is a sign of abuse, there are people who think changing your child's diet and routine to lose weight is abuse. Here we have a tweet from someone named Lindsay, and it is and it has a link to an article titled, Is Fat Phobia More Damaging Than Childhood Obesity Itself? And the tweet says, Spoiler alert, yes, fat phobia is more damaging than the boogeyman of childhood obesity. Imagine what could be done with the energy and money that goes into dieting strategies and campaigns of fear. What if it were spent on efforts to reduce inequality? Before we click on the link, 
the whole why don't we focus on the social economic issue instead of childhood obesity is ridiculous. We can work on both, and the inequality issue being solved could play a part in actually solving childhood obesity. Also, calling the very real and proven issue of childhood obesity the boogeyman is clearly them just trying to appeal to emotion by the viewer. We associate boogeyman with a scary but fake threat. Basically calling childhood obesity a fake problem made to just scare people. With that in mind, let's actually look at this article. So I'm going to point out some red flags in this article by Monarch. We see buzz phrases like war against kids and saying people see fat children as a virus personified. No one is trying to punish children for being fat. There is no war against children. Wanting to make sure kids have the healthiest life possible is not an evil conspiracy. A quote that really got to me is, Forcing exercise and diets on your children is an attempt to punish them for their perceived fatness, and that is abuse. Here we have that claim that intentional weight loss efforts are abuse. Now, if this specified that extreme fat diets and borderline torturous exercises abuse, I would totally agree. But given the context, they mean any changes at all that are made to promote weight loss. There are ways, which we will discuss near the end, to help kids lose weight that does not promote extreme restriction or bad body image, or is punishment. Making changes so your kid is healthier is the opposite of punishment. It is being a responsible parent. Another red flag I saw was the writer referencing the book Fearing the Black Body as a source to claim BMI is racist and bizarre. If I were to get into why that book is pretty much just BS used to convince uneducated people of a problem that doesn't exist, we would be here all day. There is a video series by Sam at Every Size who actually has a history degree and she breaks down the book, its sources, and all the information being misrepresented to try and convince the reader that fatphobia or the BMI is racist. So go watch those. But let's move on. The next red flag is when the author references a study says, it seriously challenges our understanding of obesity as a killer. And I'm not sure if they were just hoping no one would click the article, but I did. So what does it say? The conclusion of the article states, Relative to normal weight, both obesity, all grades, and grade 2 and 3 obesity were associated with significantly higher all-cause mortality. The conclusion showing that weight is, in fact, the killer it is made out to be, directly contradicts the statement made by Monarch. This last part is honestly kind of silly because what was the writer thinking? But it says, After a decade of this messaging, of putting kids on diets, of publicly shaming them for their size, of counting every calorie and monitoring every pound. Shouldn't we see a nation of slender kids or improved health outcomes? Why is heart disease still such a looming threat? Now, I obviously don't agree with putting kids on crazy diets, public shaming, hyper fixating on weight, all that. But I also don't agree with the blatant description that uh, try to paint any weight loss as extreme measures. The question of, if diets work, then why are people still getting heart disease? Ignored that fat, di that fat dieting due to higher obesity rates is just proof that obesity is a problem. The reason kids aren't getting thinner these days is because the obesogenic environment we live in makes it very hard to, and that environment is only growing. The fad diets promoted, we already know, aren't helpful. This is like asking, how are there more and more drug addicts when there are so many recovery programs? It's because the programs that really help people aren't accessible to many, many addicts. There are more addicts and more fat people than there are places and people that can help for free or very low cost. Heart disease, diabetes, etc. are a growing problem because the root of obesity is not being changed. Maybe if fast food places became illegal, and the government subsidized healthier food, there would be a lot more changes. That and more for help for those who need it. Alright, so this next tweet says, 
that phobia is harmful in so many ways and unfortunately it is hidden within National Childhood Obesity Awareness Month. Here is one person's story, how fat phobia and the focus of childhood obesity affected me. Now, I have this here because I don't believe using a personal experience on how you were negatively impacted by people who didn't know how to talk to you about weight and health is a valid reason to discount childhood obesity awareness. We can all agree that shaming kids helps no one. That isn't exactly news. But obesity isn't helpful either, and trying to completely disregard the issue altogether because of a bad experience, instead of discounting the general effort, use your experience to help those helping kids understand better ways to go about childhood obesity that doesn't hurt the kids the way it hurt you. Awareness itself is important, and it isn't the issue. The last tweet we are going to look at are from a dietitian who doesn't believe childhood obesity is a real problem. Alyssa Rumsey is an anti-diet dietitian who has a website for Online Intuitive Eating, Coaching, Weight Inclusive Nutrition Care, and Body Image Healing, with a subheading that says, Are you ready to stop dieting and start living? Which, okay, those aren't mutually exclusive. But anyway, that is what her whole deal is. She is all about intuitive eating, which I can do a whole video on later. This tweet by her, though, says, A child is 242 times more likely to have an ED than they are to have type 2 diabetes. Yet the vast majority of our public health education is spent on warning parents and kids about childhood obesity. Why? Fat phobia, not health. Now, I looked hard for the statistic she provided, but couldn't find it. The evidence she does provide is literally her own book, which is classic online anti-diet dietitian behavior. So according to the ANAD, about 9% of the US population, or 28.8 million people, kids and adults, have an ED, which accounts all EDs, not just restrictive. And according to the CDC, more than 37 million Americans have diabetes in general, and 90 to 95% of those are type 2, which means about 33 million people in the US have type 2 diabetes. That is a lot more than the 28 million with EDs, and we don't know how many of those people have both issues. This isn't to say EDs are not a problem. They are. They are a very serious problem. But obesity in general and type 2 diabetes is still more common than EDs. With that said, I don't think even comparing these statistics is useful. I could also say that more people get heart disease than type 2 diabetes, but that doesn't mean diabetes isn't important. Obesity itself, for some, could be seen as a type of ED if it presents that way. So I think that has to be thought about when discussing childhood obesity and EDs. How many of these obese kids already have an ED involving binging, but it won't ever be addressed because trying to fix it will suddenly cause the restrictive type of ED. This is something I have actually witnessed, like this thought process. Someone in my family started noticeably being overweight and then obese at a young age. It was clear they were binge eating to cope with trauma. They told me that themselves, and I offered to help them work on that issue in any way that I could. When I discussed this issue with their parent, the parent told me they are scared of trying to help their own child's binge eating problems because they fear they will just end up with a restrictive ED. This person is still obese as they enter adulthood, and that could have been prevented if the clear ED they already had was taken seriously, instead of just ignored out of fear of causing a different restrictive ED. To compare this logic, think about a kid who is very unmotivated for school and is constantly getting bad grades, but by being too afraid of causing a perfectionist, overly stressed, study-obsessive person, help is not provided to try and fix the problem. Anything can be taken to extreme, and many are already in extremes when it comes to obesity. Helping someone does not automatically mean the only other option is the opposite extreme. Here, we are going to look at someone who was very overweight as a kid and how that has impacted her. In the seventh grade, I was five feet tall and 185 pounds. And I remember this so pointedly because I had gone to the ER in extreme distress. And when the doctor put me on the scale, 
he looked at me and said, do you know how much you weigh? And in that moment, everything had shifted. And it should come as no surprise that two years later, I developed an extreme eating disorder that was praised. It was praised not only by my family and friends, but also by medical professionals who in just one quick look in my throat or my diet would have seen that something was extremely wrong. And I don't think we talk about the level of trauma that comes with being an obese child. I don't think we talk about the fact that every day I walk on this planet now, I live with undoing layers of trauma from that period of time. And as someone who stands five foot three and 152 pounds now, that shame still comes back from doctors. And that's something we need to change. So 185 at five feet is definitely a troubling number for anyone especially a child. I'm 5'8 and an adult, and my highest weight was 185, and that was extremely uncomfortable. It would be important to ensure healthier habits and weight loss for a child that size. With that said, she didn't seem to get the best care from her doctor or parents, and the way they went about weight loss ended up making her obsessive over it and view herself horribly. I think there is something to be said with doctors and parents using more empathy when dealing with a child for any health condition. It is important to recognize that the medical advice to lose weight was not bad, but the clear overlooking of diet and emotional needs from the parents and doctor are the issue. Here is a TikTok from a dietitian after she made a five things I wouldn't do to my kids as an ED coach. She mentioned being against intentional weight loss, and someone commented, what if my child is overweight? Here's her response. I posted a video talking about the five things I would never do as a mom as an eating disorder dietitian. And this is one of the questions I got. What if your kid is overweight for whatever reason? What do you do? And my short answer is to love them anyway and treat them exactly how you would treat them if they were in a smaller sized body. And I know that might sound like crazy advice because we live in a world that tells us that there is a right way to have a body and that smaller bodies are automatically healthier and larger bodies are automatically unhealthier. And I always believe that parents have the best intentions for their kids, and they truly do just want them to be healthy and happy. But my advice remains the same. Do not body shame them. Do not tell them that they need to lose weight or change the way that they look. Do not encourage them to diet or restrict their food intake. Do not encourage them to exercise for the purpose of losing weight. Continue to offer them variety at meals. Reinforce to them that they know their bodies best and they can trust their hunger and fullness cues. Encourage them to move in a way that feels good for them for the purpose of being strong and being healthy and not for the purpose of changing the way that they look. If your kid lives in a larger body, I guarantee that they know that. And hearing it from doctors and teachers and parents and peers and siblings does nothing but reinforce to them that their body is wrong. Body diversity exists. You can live in a larger body and be healthy. Those things are not mutually exclusive. And just because your child lives in a larger body does not mean they deserve any different treatment. I think it is interesting how she specified to love your child the same. I don't think anyone was implying that the commenter wouldn't love their kid. It seems unnecessary, but that's honestly the least of the problems with this response. She goes on about how smaller and larger bodies are not healthy or unhealthy, Basically, an overweight kid doesn't mean that they need to change an eating or activity habit. This, in my opinion, is dangerous advice. I doubt she would tell a parent of a very underweight child to just not care about it. Her point about not focusing the kid on weight loss, I think, is sound. As in, you don't need to berate the child about their weight. But it doesn't seem like she would agree with changing diet and activity for weight loss, but in a way where the kid doesn't realize that either. When it comes to more serious restriction, I think it really depends. Like, if your kid clearly has a borderline addiction to something really unhealthy, it may be good to put on some restriction and just explain that food is not the best for you to have that much. And this goes for any child of any size. When it comes to children knowing their hunger cues well, that is true if the kid is not consuming anything that inhibits those cues. The hunger hormone ghrelin is impacted by the food you eat. High protein and healthy carbs lowers ghrelin while processed 
and fatty foods increase that hormonal response. In a world where food is manufactured to be addictive, to combat that hormone that signals your brain to stop eating, it is hard to trust your those hunger cues if that is what your diet is high in. If overweight children are eating a lot of processed, fatty, sugary foods, telling them to trust their hunger cue may not be the best advice. This is where some restriction in portion control, I think, can be handy. Obviously, it isn't good to overdo it to completely restrict junk food, but making sure there are more healthy foods that keep those hunger hormones working as they should is extremely important in your kid being able to truly trust their hunger and fullness cues. I get really frustrated with the whole body diversity thing when it comes to being unhealthily overweight and obese. It is talked about like it is just a natural thing to be very large when it isn't. There has to be external factors to make a child obese. Saying that you can be healthy and very overweight are mutually exclusive. There are literal chemical reactions caused by fat cells that create inflammation and hormonal issues along with insulin resistance. You can't be all around healthy in your body if it is in a constant state of inflammation due to excess fat. As a final response to her, I do agree that focusing the child on just their weight is not helpful. I don't agree, though, that body diversity equals it being possible to be healthy and have too much excess fat. We have enough scientific evidence to show the impacts of fat cells. Dietitians like this seem to have a good intentions, but I truly wonder how they respond to very underweight or overweight kids in real life. You can promote healthy habits, discourage toxic thinking, and body image, all while recognizing the role weight plays in our health, especially a child's. Part 4. So how do we treat kids with obesity? I'm going to state again that I am not a health professional, just someone who has witnessed childhood obesity on a personal level and has been interested in this topic since I was little. My knowledge only stretches as far as the credible articles I read from, researchers, doctors, and dietitians. Always seek professional help if you can, when dealing with any medical issue. With that said, here is what the experts think when addressing childhood obesity. Basically, it comes down to not singling out the child. As in, instead of just changing the way the obese child eats and exercises, make it a whole family change. This is helpful as most likely the rest of the family is overweight or obese as well and it doesn't alienate the child. Psychology Today states that when researching parenting types in weight, parents who are responsive but not psychologically pressuring fostered healthier children and lower BMIs. Then, for the opposite of that parenting type, too much restriction and pressure on kids can have the opposite effect than what was intended. It is shown to increase BMI in children, and that makes sense too. Imagine any time when you were a kid and you had to learn how to do something really hard. For me, it was math. I was very bad at mat math. I remember being brought to tears by being yelled at for my grades and being called very discouraging things. No surprise that my grades didn't improve. It wasn't until I went into remedial math that I had a teacher that was very empathetic and understanding of my struggle with numbers. I ended up making an A in that class I think most people have experienced this dynamic in some way, shape, or form. Positive reinforcement is much more effective than negative. The article continues to mention ways that parents may single out their kid, like making different meals for them, eating separately, and emphasizing the weight of the child instead of the importance of healthy eating for the whole family. This can be seen like common sense, right? But it is surprisingly difficult in families that have generations of bad eating habits to change for the better of the children. Or, on the other hand, it can make parents who are very shameful towards their overweight kids even more so. Behavioral changes are hard, no matter what they are for, but it is the responsibility of the parents or guardians to deal with that hardship, but not show any anger or resentment towards the child. Conclusion Childhood obesity is a very real and recorded issue. There are no benefits in your keeping your child overweight or obese. While it can be complicated to navigate, it is still one deserving of time, education, and responsibility. On a societal and economic level, there are things that can be done to make it easier for parents or guardians to promote the health of children. 
the root of the growing obesity epidemic isn't purely just a lack of care from parents. It can be in some cases, as we have seen, but to state any parent who has an overweight child does not care or love their child is a bold one, and not a helpful one either. The stories of people who suffer due to intense diet restrictions as fat children are important, but they should be used to help people understand what not to do when addressing a weight problem. Not used to just say, any intentional weight loss for kids is a form of abuse. Just like anything else, weight loss efforts go to the extreme and really harm kids' view on themselves and food. There isn't much we, as average consumers, can do about the obesogenic environment we have to live in, but we can control, within reason, how we interact with it. We can also control how we respond to children with weight issues, and while it is a touchy subject, it is important. Childhood obesity has so many well-recorded health implications that can impact them for the rest of their lives. Addressing this issue early is important. The trend of fat acceptance is leaking into how we should respond to obesity in kids, which is not responding at all. The goal for any parent should be to keep their kid as healthy as they can with what they have to work with. Saying it is normal to have excessive weight as a child is false, and it is impacting their development. Intentional weight loss for kids does not equal an automatic development of a restrictive ED. The whole point in changing the way a child eats and exercises is to improve their relationship with food and activity, not hinder it or make it worse. All in all, childhood obesity is a serious problem, and it needs to be treated as such, not ignored. That is going to be all for me, y'all. This was a really intense subject to get into, and I didn't even dive into every single thing or else this video would have been like four hours long. Let me know what you think about the whole idea that childhood obesity is a fake issue. And if you have experience with childhood obesity, please leave your stories in the comments if you're comfortable doing so. Or you can share your stories on my Twitter or Instagram linked in the description. Subscribe for more content, like and share if you so please. Have a great day, y'all, and go on a walk if you can.